Hey, it's Chris. Leisure Games. Throw me a subscription. Blah, blah, blah. Trying to hit a thousand by 2021, sometime in 2021. Not by 2021. That's ridiculous. I'd have to have a sponsor like, you know, Dice Tower or Quackalope say, go over to this guy. Anyway, uh, we have a special guest tonight, in case you weren't aware. Uh, my cat, one of them. Her name is Karama. Yeah, that's right. I named her after an anime nine-tailed fox. So let's talk my favorite of all topics. Let's talk Kickstarter. I love Kickstarter. I love crowdfunding. I'm going to talk about uh, upcoming Kickstarters in the next couple videos. But they're all going to be a little bit different. This first video is actually going to be upcoming Kickstarters that I am most anticipating being delivered. As you have maybe heard in other videos, I think I've gotten a little bit better at picking games that I'm actually going to like. I know, it's a novel concept, I know. This was a really hard list to make. I picked 10 games, and I had probably 16 to 20 that I think will arrive sometime in the first half of 2021. Because this list is really only going to dive into the first half of 2021, because that's still within another six-month time frame. And there are plenty of those games that I will most likely not even get before quarter number three of 2021. Let's let's be honest here. Kickstarter is notorious for being late. So I kind of ballparked some of these. I kind of went off some of the dates that are projected. I did a little bit of digging in some of the Kickstarter pages to try and figure it out. And then, I, honestly, I just fudged a couple of the dates and added a couple months and to see where they kind of fell. So that's kind of how I did. And now what's going to be interesting, and this is a personal preference... Because what's going to be on my list, there's going to be a lot of games that are a little bit higher up for a lot of other people that the hotness is really going to, you know, smack really good. And it's going to be a lot lower on my list. And I'll tell you right now, the reason that some of those are going to be lower on my list is because I think they're going to be harder to get to the table. I know enough about what I'm capable of, what my game group likes, and what is just physically feasible with three children under seven, including a three month old at this point about what I can play for how long I can play and when I can play. So that is accurately depicted in these rankings. This is not just a purely, what do I think is going to be the most hotness of all these games? That ranking and that list would be completely different. You know, if I was one of these big channels that had all the time in the world and my literal job was to just go around and play games for like six or eight hours a day and make reviews on them all day long, this list would be different. How different? I don't know. Because I think my taste is a lot different than some of the other bigger names out there just on what I like and I don't like. So anyway, I've been blabbing for too long enough. That even the cat is getting bored at this point. So you probably are too. So let's dive right into the list. I have a video, 30 minutes of video, only to find that you were paused for the last 30 minutes. Me neither. <laughs> okay. Let's start over. Now, let's do a little preamble. And let's, let me tell you what did not make the top 10. For one, one that's going to be super high I'm anticipating on a lot of other people's lists. Frosthaven didn't make my top 10, people. You want to know why? All those reasons I just mentioned. Frosthaven ain't getting to the table anytime soon, folks. I know myself. I'm not going to try and solo that beast. It's going to be after the pandemic, when the kids are older, when they can grasp more strategy, or when we can get it to the table with the group. And honestly, it's probably not even the first campaign game that I will probably try to get to the table with the group. I mean, I have Kingdom Death. I have Midara. Those things... I, Almost, you know, right now, I'd rather take precedent. Something else that's not going to be on this list? Guards of Atlantis 2. The epitome of a MOBA-type game done on a tabletop. Why? Because it's mainly a one-on-one, -on -one or two-on-two, -two or three-on-three. -three. The circumstances for that game have to be incredibly exact. It reminds me the most of Millennium Blades, if you're familiar with that, from Level 99 Games. They'll make an appearance later on this list. What I mean by that is, for Millennium Blades, the meta-meta LCG 
Magic the Gathering all wrapped into a ball. It has to be for a perfect audience. When it is for that audience and when it is right, it is absolutely like a symphony, well-tuned and playing in sync. But you have to also know your audience. If the audience wants to hear a symphony, you have a symphony. If the audience wants to hear rock, you better not have a symphony. That's why it didn't make the top 10. Now, let's talk top 10. What did make the top 10? Let's start with number 10. Let's get right into it. Number 10 is Lizard Wizard. So Lizard Wizard, why is Lizard Wizard beating out something like Frosthaven on my rank list? Well, let me tell you, go back to those criteria I just mentioned. I have been looking for a gateway-esque game for my seven-year-old, he will be at that time, by the time I get this game. He has outplayed Splendor. He no longer gets enjoyment out of Splendor. The 120 times that we have played Splendor or so, he has just outgrown it. He is looking for the next level up. He wants to play things like Marvel Legendary with me. He wants to play that step up stuff. And this is sort of what I see that as. Now, this is not a new type of game. This is by the people who made Raccoon Tycoon. This was a deluxe version of the game that I ended up getting and I'll pull up the Kickstarter page here in a second and do you a little comparison. But this is one that I went right down to the wire with. This is a set collection, auction, multiple asymmetric powers, seven different classes. I mean, you are a lizard who is a wizard. And there are seven mystical classes that you can choose from. And that each have different ways of playing that you need to adapt to. And like I mentioned, the mechanisms in this game are nothing unique. The mechanisms together are necessarily nothing unique, but based on the early comments, watching an actual playthrough, watch playthroughs. If you remember nothing from this video, otherwise, when you back Kickstarters, watch playthroughs. It looks like the sum of the parts is better than the individual parts. And in combination with it being a step up for my son as something we can play together, that is why it beat other games on this list. I'm excited for that. Let's pull the page up and take a little closer look a second. So I did the limited premium edition that's coming with a few extras. They did the daily unlock goals, which frankly speaking, some of them just seems superfluous. I don't like some of them, but this is a game where I'm not sure what's going to hold up and what's not. This was one where that was one of the main reasons I waited until the last minute to make a decision. Because this $49 pledge level isn't going to hold up. Now the alternative pledge level was $89, and that was for the Archmage pledge level, which gets you wooden pieces, player mats, and metal coins. Well, if you've heard nothing else on my channel in the past, I'm not a big fan of any of those and paying for those during Kickstarter. Are those worth an additional $40? Is that as a secondhand buyer, as in buying from someone who backed the Kickstarter, are you going to want to pay $90 plus shipping? Because everybody knows that you got to pay your own shipping. From somebody else for a game like this, especially if it isn't an absolute slam dunk hit with wooden pieces, metal coins, and a playmat. Probably not. That's probably not a price point you're going to want to pay for a game like this. And I think the retail version, this was this was really interesting. Miniature Market accidentally leaked the retail price, I think, during the campaign. It was something like 34 bucks, something along those lines. And so that was the other concern, is how much of a difference is it going to be? Especially at this $49 pledge level, which I'm going to pay probably 15 bucks on shipping on. And as a side note, doing this list made me realize how many of these pledges I still have to pay shipping on, which I'm also not looking forward to. Anyway, um, so... That is Lizard Wizard as a whole. Now, again, the art is beautiful, but the art is not why we buy games, people. Remember, the art can draw you in to look at a game for a closer look, but you should not be buying a game based on art or the beauty of it in the first place. You will end up with too many games that are either art first, gameplay second, or just beautiful and you hate the way they play, even if they're great. So that's Lizard Wizard. That's probably my biggest hit or miss on the list in terms of will I actually like it? But I'm giving it a chance because I think it's got a lot of elements that are going to appeal. We'll see.
Now let's go to number nine. Number nine is gonna be one that you're probably not gonna have on your list. Other people aren't gonna have on their lists. I'd be surprised if any of the big guys out there even had this on their radar. This was only backed by 2,000 people earlier in this year or the end of last year, I can't remember. It is Gorinto from Grand Gamers Guild. What is Gorinto? Why are you even interested? Why is it number nine? Why did it beat out Frosthaven? It beat it out because it's going to be a game that fits me and my personality and my ability to get to the table, as well as something I think my wife will like. Gorinto is an abstract, two-player, perfect information type game where there are five different elements. You're making tile stacks on the board. Which element you lay affects the tiles around it in different ways. So if you lay a fire, it maybe branches out in straight lines. If you lay a wind, it does something else. So different ways of capturing, collecting, building piles. Why do I think this is good? Because I think like a lot of abstracts, this one hits the key mark. The key mark is elegance in its simplicity. What do I mean by that? I mean that the overhead is very low, but the intuitive gameplay is very deep in terms of each time you play it, it is going to show you more nuances and more strategies and different results than previously played. And that is what I think this one has. Now, I like this one too, because this one is actually a local one. I'm not having to pay shipping on it, right? Yes. Based out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Stop by sometime. I'd love to play games with you. You know when the whole pandemic thing's over. Anyway, the one caveat with this was that it did have some metal coins in the pledge. It had a little miniature. It had a mini expansion that was exclusive as well. But since I'm not paying shipping, it was a cost I'm willing to pay because I think I'm getting my money's worth then from that. We often judge things by appearances, first impressions. And the first impression of this is very positive. The gameplay is positive. The local supporting of a designer is positive, and the fact that it fits me is positive, and that is why it's number nine. But that's also why I don't think you'll see it on any other list. So, I would love to put out a review after I get it, just to see, hopefully, if it matches my expectations. Number nine, Grinto. Number eight. You didn't think I was going to leave all the big boys off this list, did you? I'm a big Simon fan. I'm a fanboy. I have a bunch of their games. There's a, You're going to see them later on this list. Oh, see? See? Sorry. Anyway. Awaken Realms has put out consistent hits. And they have been getting better with their games, arguably, from one to the next. So, the fact that Nemesis Lockdown here is number eight should surprise very few. Why is it only number eight? Because, as I mentioned before, I think it's a very select crowd. Because the rules overhead with just the original core of Nemesis was a lot larger than a lot of games. Although, once you get into it, and maybe once you start playing, it becomes more intuitive and it becomes more second nature. The actual upfront learning curve is a little steeper. Nemesis itself, it, it wasn't a perfect game. But it was perfect for the people that like that type of game. You like some chaos. You like some take that. You like some unpredictability. You like some unfairness. The fact that sometimes you just get screwed in games. If you don't like that, you weren't going to like Nemesis. That's that's just the core of it. I opted for Nemesis Lockdown. Am I going to pick up Nemesis? I don't know. I'm not really sure I need both of these. I'm not really sure I'm going to have the ability to get both of these to the table, let alone one with a consistent basis. As I think Alex Radcliffe said from Board Game Co., this is how you weigh things in this game. Nemesis is ceiling is right here. Nemesis Lockdown has the potential to have a ceiling up here. But if you're talking what is the worst that could happen, Nemesis, their basement is here because you already know what you're getting or not getting. It is This is what it is. Lockdown does have the potential at the same time to be higher, but it also has the potential to have a lower basement. Why do I think it's not? Because I think Awakened Realms has been significantly responsive to critiques, criticisms across the board for their games, their gameplay, their elements, as well as from big names to Kickstarter backers with concerns. They've shown that. 
and I'm willing to trust them that they're going to learn as they've shown us they've already been willing to learn and adapt with the previous games. And they're going to apply it with Lockdown to make Lockdown that much better. Because it fits a narrative horror type S game that isn't really well reproduced anywhere else. I mean, you can talk about the betrayals and the House on the Haunted Hills, but it's not really the same. It's a different element genre. And they've shown that they can put out good stuff. And I have faith in them. So you can call me a Wake and Realms fanboy as well, too, I guess. It's not the worst thing I get called. Number seven is Wonderland's War. Now, this is by Druid City Game. You may know them from recent hits like Tidal Blades or Grim Forest or my personal favorite, Sorcerer City. Now, why is that important? Because I think none of those games have been widely panned as great, amazing, over-the-top type games. I would make the argument in a separate video that Sorcerer City deserves a place in my top 25 type of games, but it is a game that is tile placement real-time, simultaneous play, and a lot of people don't like that those aspects of things. It just doesn't fit well with people. Side note, that game also probably has the best metal coins I've ever seen in the market, so take that for what you will. But Grim Forest is not widely considered a great game. Tidal Blades is considered a very good game right now by the consensus hotness, but it's not considered an amazing game by many people. Very good, yes. Sort of like the difference between the Hall of Fame versus the Hall of Very Good. And that is my concern with Wonderland's War. Now, what is Wonderland's War, and why would a game like this, with a deluxe history, when I've already stated I am not a big fan of deluxifications in the first place, be as high as it is, ranking number seven on my list. So, right here, this is why. You have a retail edition for $85 with premium chips. Now, Chris, you're going, you just said you hate premium components. Why are you, why are you shooting yourself in the foot? Why are you being such a hypocrite? Hear me out on this one. This game is an area control type bag builder. What are some other bag builders that you know? Or games where you are pulling cardboard chits from bags. Orleans, Blitzkrieg, Quacks of Quendelenburg, Arkham Horror LCG. What's a common thing that's happened with a couple of those games? Do you know the answer? The answer is that the most common criticism is that those cardboard chits start to wear very quickly. And that... The fact is, there is a whole secondary market for premium components for those games, or you have people buying individual capsules to put each individual chit in. The geek bits on the Board Game Geek store sell for more than the frickin' cost of Quacks of Quendelenburg in the first place. And people buy them to the point where they're out of stock consistently. Think about that for a minute. Now, look back at this pledge level and tell me, is this a good idea or not? I'm getting the retail edition. I'm getting standees instead of miniatures. I don't think these miniatures are anything to write home about. I'm sure that I, the size-wise, they won't be that impressive for me as someone's non-miniature person, so I'm completely okay with passing on them. I mean, look at these standees for a second. These standees pop. The art is bright. It's crisp. It's going to look great on the table just from that side of things. I can't paint miniatures to make it look like that. Now, why does this matter? Why do I think this is a good value? Because if you're saying even the retail is $50, let's say the retail is $40 and you can get free shipping. I'm paying $45 for the extras and the chips. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of Brass, the new Brass Kickstarter that had the clay chips that people went bazooka gonzo over that people couldn't get on a secondary market, that they started a whole new freaking Kickstarter for because people wanted them that badly. This is what that reminds me of. I am getting over 200 of these quality poker plastic chips for use in the bag builder when we already know that's the biggest dilemma that faces bag builders. $45? Sounds like a pretty good price. More than I would want to pay? Probably. 
But I think in combination with all the other extras that you're getting, I think it's going to make up for it because you're getting all the stretch goals too. So you're not just paying for the chips, you're getting the stretch goals and the extras. And so for that price, it's a slam dunk. Now, the area control side of things, I won't lie, that 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 concerns me. There's a reason I don't have Rising Sun, Blood Rage, or Enos still in my collection. I have El Grande, I have Iwari, I love those, but I don't have those other three. And so area control is the biggest concern for me in this. But the drafting, the bag building element, the area control tower defense type aspect is really up my alley. And I think if they do it right here, this has the chance to put them on the map more than any of their other previous games has. That is why it is number seven on my list. Number six. Number six on my list. I mentioned I was going to be talking about them earlier. Now is the time. This is level 99's moment. Level 99 games, bullet. It's an asynchronous, real-time shooter-esque game. It's a real-time shoot 'em up puzzle type game where you are each a heroine that has a different power, different pattern that you can use to manipulate the tiles on your board to make it a certain way so that you can, in return, fire it at somebody else, whether that is another player or if you're playing cooperatively against the AI boss. Why is this a good game? Again, this is one of those where level 99 games is on Kickstarter have not recently been appealing to me because I feel like the pledges and the Campaigns in general have been more designed for retail purposes rather than Kickstarter because I think they've been burned. Like I mentioned with Millennium Blades Collusion, which is now going to be over a year late because of stretch goals and because of other projects taking precedent. This one, though, has been pirate positive. They came to Kickstarter significantly farther than probably 95% of all other Kickstarters that come to Kickstarter. They already had everything basically laid out. This was the first game that I had seen hyped prior to the campaign that you could play it on Tabletopia. Not saying this was the first game that did that, but this was the first one I saw majorly hyped in that way. It's unlike anything else. And like I've already mentioned about Millennium Blades, level 99, when they strike oil, they strike it hard. And they're willing to go out there and do something different. For better and for worse, they've had a few failures, they've had a few great things. Imperial, Millennium Blades, I think this is going to be in those lines. And if it is one of those, all of those games sell for higher through their web store than they do during Kickstarter. That is a fact. Now, did I need the wooden pieces that went along with it? No. But I think for the price point of $45, including the wooden pieces, is going to be a relatively good deal. And I'm a level 99 fanboy too. Not everything, but a lot of stuff. Anyway, so that is why it is number six, because I think it's going to be very easy to get to the table as well. The overhead is relatively low, asymmetrical characters that you can switch around and play and do different each time. You have the cooperative as well as the competitive. It looks like it's fun. It's not going to be the most strategic. It's not going to be the most uh, tactical, you know, deep thinking game. It's just going to be a lot of fun. And that moves stuff up higher on the list for me than almost anything else. That's why it's number six, period. Now, number five. This one, I am assuming we're going to get in the first half of 2021, which is why I included on this side of the list, but very frankly and openly speaking, but I would also not terribly be surprised if it ends up being, you know, 10 months from now either. I could easily see it happening. And that is Oathsworn. Oathsworn by Shadowborn Games. This raised almost $2 million on Kickstarter. I pledged for standees, again. I thought the miniatures were probably a big turnoff, actually. I was not a big fan of the non-PVC, and also the fact that you were going to have to put some of them together, as well as this whole removable parts to match the weapons they were holding. It just didn't... It didn't grip me. Apparently, I'm one of the few people. Like, when Tiny Epic Games did it, they put these little weapons in the little meeple guy's hands. People were, oh my gosh, that's so cute. It's so amazing. It's sort of like how I feel about with the interchangeable arms. Like, you take the guy's arm off and he has an arm with an axe now instead of an arm with a sword. Like, I don't really care what weapon he's holding. I As long as he's, you know, got the right thing card in front of me, I don't really... You know, as long as it's doing the right thing, I don't really care what it looks like. So, I, I like the concept of it. It's taking a different spin 
on sort of the boss battler campaign evolution and mythos. It's also got sort of a KDM element where there is a lot of mystery about what you're going to be fighting next. In fact, the spoilers and the boxes are marked in just that way. Am I going to regret not getting the miniatures? Probably. You know, it's FOMO. That feeling is going to be there no matter what. At the same time, does it allow me to buy a couple other games? Yeah. My biggest concern, and the reason it's not higher on this list, is because of the accessibility. Just like KDM, it's going to be a campaign game. How many campaign games do I need? A lot, apparently. I, they are, I'm a sucker for campaign games, so say what you will. I think most of us are who are in this realm of things. If you like one, there's usually two or three that you're liking as well. So that's why it's only number five. But I think it's different enough from a Madara, from an Aeon Odyssey Trespass, from a KDM, that it stands on its own. They hit a ton of stretch goals. You're getting a ton of stuff. And the early people who have played it in terms of online and prototypes is very, very, very positive. So that's all that really has to be said. In case you're wondering, I have two cats. This, wandering around the background, is Loki. He has no concern for anybody else but himself. But he's cute. Anyway. I mean, let's take a look here just at the artwork and the mechanisms. These cards look drastically different than any other gameplay ones I've seen from other campaign style games. The combat is different in terms of how you're actually doing it with rolling dice as well as playing cards. And it just looks a lot different in how you're using your abilities and the energy given than other games I've seen. This is what you're looking for when you're debating about whether or not you should pledge. And this is one of the reasons I didn't pledge the recent Bard Song. It's because I looked at it and I said, I need something more different rather than just light to spend my money on. There's way too much stuff already to spend it on. I can't justify it having something that overlaps too much with something that's already out there. And so for me, this was one that I was super hyped on beforehand. It did not let me down during. The only question really was, like I said, standees versus miniatures, and I ended up with standees. So take that for if you will. I am one of the very few people that get standees as much as they're clamored for. At least I put my money where my mouth is. I know that's a lot of a lot of people complain about not hitting standees, but then nobody gets them. I'm one of them, so you can yell at me. I never complain though. I take it for what it is. So anyway, that is number five, Oath Sworn. That's enough. You you either know it or you don't at this point. Now, this is where we're getting into the nitty-gritty, the top five. So this was not easy. We're splitting hairs at this point. These games are very similar upcoming. You know, which is going to be better? Which is going to have more long-lasting flavor, appeal, play style? I think that's going to be where the, the interesting dynamics come in. So like a year, a year and a half from now, when you go back to rank these and compare these, everybody's going to have a little bit different nuance and a little bit different take. It's a little bit of a controversial one because... I do not have the best track record with this company, and I think their games are, are kind of hit or miss for me, and they have unfortunately been more miss, but I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, because if it is good, I think it's a dark horse as one of my favorite new games coming up, and that's Tokyo Sidekick uh, by Japanime Games. I've not been terribly impressed by the product they've put out with some of the other games that I've gotten and some of the other games that I've skipped. The Sword Art Online game, uh, I got one of their games from the little package of triplet games from a couple years ago. I think I got Mirror Rest, which was an okay game, but the text was really hard to read. The artwork was fantastic, but a lot of these are imports of Japanese versions, and so that is their specialty as if it wasn't evidenced by their name in the first place. And this is my concern, is it's generic in terms of fantasy, cooperative, heroes saving the city, and it's standees only. They opted for no miniatures in this, which is the interesting thing. And it actually failed funding the first time. They came back a second time and were able to fund decently successfully with revised pledge levels, revised prices, and that sort of thing. My concern is that, is it going to stand out enough? And is the gameplay actually going to stand up? Especially since I just pledged another high amount for Freedom 5, the Sentinels comics game of a similar nature, and you have Hour of Need, which is also out there in the same genre. Those two combinations of things make me, frankly speaking, a little scared, because I also just played The Loop uh, from the French designer Ketchup Games, which 
is a great game. And so how many of these games do I need? Are they going to be different enough that it's going to justify a place in my collection? You're playing as a hero, but also a sidekick for each hero. And you're leveling up and doing sort of a deck building thing while you're doing the saving throughout the city. And so it is more pandemic-esque and you're stomping out the fires as the bad guys pop up. It's hard. And there were a couple reviews and previews that came out before the campaign, which for a lot of their games, there really haven't been. So that was encouraging to me. Watching it played made me feel better. But still looking back on it now, I'd say that is probably the second highest game I feel like could be a letdown on this list for me. So all in all, makes me a little nervous. Now on the plus side, it's a game that's already out there. A game that has already been tested by the market in Japan. And as you can see, it was a Tokyo Game Market Awards winner. So this is not a game that is a pure unknown, purely uh, speculative in terms of gameplay that has not been hashed out and has not been uh, reviewed. Now, the one thing I'll say on this game is that we're looking at some of the pledge levels. You're getting this exclusive game sleeve. I could care less. You're getting the sidekick comic book, again, which I could care less about. But this is a game that, if it's actually decent... I don't know if this will be at retail because it's not going to be a, a smash hit. It's going to be one that flies under the radar and it's going to be one that sort of sneaks in. And so from that side of things, there was a little bit of FOMO and I was willing to take the risk of the little bit higher pledge level because the same thing with an expansion for a game like this is it's not going to be available if it's good. So could I potentially lose money in this? Absolutely. Is this a great deal? Not really. But at the same time, I recognize where it might also fall through the gaps because a lot of these foreign market games that make their way over here sort of have that happen. They don't have wide distribution, especially at several of the larger stores online. So you can't assume that you're going to be able to get them that way. You just can't. And if you're going to, then, yeah, I mean, you, there is potential that you're going to miss out on a great game and we all have plenty of great games, so that's not a big deal. But this one, with all of those thematic mechanisms and and just cooperative play all of those things combined it looks like a really good game that fits my style and other things that i have enjoyed thoroughly so that is why is it as high on the list as it is plus i'm an anime fan in general so it's striking all chords for me number three one of my other fanboyisms that hasn't gotten yet on the list i told you it was coming ha <laughs> coming come on come on see where this is going bloodborne now Full disclaimer, just like Darkest Dungeon, I did not play Darkest Dungeon. I, I did not have it influence my backing on that campaign. Bloodborne, I also have not played. But the elements, the pedigree in which Simon sourced this out with Michael Shino, and the elements and the care that it looks like it's gone into, that's why it's number four. It's another dungeon crawl campaign done in a completely different way with both ramifications of doing quests one way versus the other, as well as some interesting mechanics in how it actually operates. I did not like the way the campaign was run, though. Way too much FOMO. I did not get the all-in. The all-in was too expensive. I did not get probably two of the bigger expansions. I did not like some of the miniatures. I thought some of the miniatures were ugly. Some of the spider ones and some of the monsters just were not appealing visually. And not having that connection to the video game made it much easier of a pass. Now, if this turns out to be one of those games, sort of like Rise of Moloch was for me, where they said some of these are going to be available, but they turn out not to be because they never went to retail. Come on, Simon, man, that game was so good. Man, make a sequel. Make a... Anyway... This game has the potential to be one of the best Simon games that they have done. And people are going to look at that statement that I just put out there and say, Simon doesn't have any good games. Simon games are all crap. They're all FOMO. Dogs of War, Rising Sun, Blood Rage, Arcadia Quest, the subsequent iterations of Zombicide. Those are all thought of as very good, relatively speaking, games. Not trash games. You can trash what you want to say about their FOMO exclusive policy. I will give you that. It's predatory sometimes. At the same time, buy it on the secondary market. I, I have no problem with that either. I think this one has 
the ability to fly under the radar for a lot of people. And this is one that I could see really surprising a lot of people because I don't think this one's going to be on a lot of people's lists as high expectations or high anticipation. I think a lot of people nowadays are keeping their CMON expectations a little lower. So if they do not meet them, they are not as disappointed as they have been necessarily in the past. Because say what you want about the overall quality, they certainly don't work with everyone. You already heard me say, I think, uh, if it wasn't lost earlier, I don't have Rising Sun or Blood Rage. I recognize the quality of those games, but I recognize also that they are not for me. That's why I passed on Unk. But I think Bloodborne is unique enough, and I like a hard game. And if they are able to translate that into a tabletop dungeon crawler, as well as I think they are, I'm really looking forward to it, and I think it's going to jump some of the other dungeon crawlers in terms of play time on my table and when they get to the table. Plus, they're Simon. If they do nothing else right, the miniatures are going to be good. And the resale ability with the FOMO is good as well. So I'm not worried about it from that side of things. As big of a chunk of money as it was putting down. That is why it is number three. Number two. This one, again, is not going to be on a lot of people's lists. Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor. What is Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor? It is a 4X post-apocalyptic cooperative game. 4X and cooperative have never really gone together before. That is why it is so exciting. It's hard. It's asymmetric. You are each different factions. You each have your own factions and you are battling two other faction-esque the game presents to you in order not to lose and to try to win. And you have to cooperate. I've never seen anything like it. I don't think there really is anything else to compare it to. If this is done well, I think this one has Spirit Island type vibes. I'll put that out there. That is a big expectation to set out there. But I look at it in that light. Because if it is done to that level, that's the level of potential that it has. Just like with Spirit Island, nothing else had really ever been done exactly that way. And this is what it gives me vibes of. It was very reasonably priced for what it was. Now, you can make an argument that $129 is a lot for co-op. It is. Absolutely. You're getting the core box. You're getting an expansion. You're getting all of the other different factions. And you're getting all of the unlocks, though. So you're getting a ton of stuff. And again, oh, it only raised $300,000. That's not very much, but it was a co-op game. That's why. And the other reason, standees instead of miniatures. Is the core pledge worth it? No, the $79 wasn't, wasn't worth it. But the all-in for four more factions, like I mentioned in this pledge, four more powerful end bosses to give more variability? Absolutely. Do I regret this at all? No. It's completely different than anything I've ever seen, anything I've ever thought of, anything I've ever played. This is what Kickstarter is all about. These are the games that make or break sometimes your will on Kickstarter. Because when you get to the top of somebody's list like this, like mine, the interest, the expectation, the wish of what you hope it will be is so high that invariably in some way you're going to be let down. I can only hope that it meets the expectation that I have a lot of fun with it and I enjoy it, not that it is going to be a top 10 grail game for me anymore. And settling those expectations a little bit has helped me in terms of finding games that I like, not being willing to pass on games I truly do love, but also passing on games that I know that... I just won't like even though the FOMO is there. The price value is good. So for me, this, this was striking all of the elements that I mentioned earlier. This is a game where I could see us playing this. We love co-ops in my group. We love co-ops. And this is something so unique that this is why we want Kickstarter in the first place, right? We want to reward innovation and dedication to the small guy. 
That's what we all say, right? So I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Do I, may I get burned? Yeah. But every once in a while, this is what it's about. That is why it is number two. Now, going in the opposite direction for number one, this is, I'm sure many people will disagree. But the initial reviews for the retail game are positive. The way it was handled during the Kickstarter was very poorly in terms of what should have been announced prior to the end of the campaign, prior to the pledge manager. But either way, it does not diminish my desire for a next step up in terms of the superhero type genre game, cooperative game, in Marvel United by Simon. As I've said, Simon has a lot of back channel communication issues and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way there were a lot of people that dropped their pledge because they didn't tell people beforehand that they could get uh at, at retail through like walmart or target before the wave one people got theirs now my argument to counter that is they might be getting it sooner but do you really care if you're getting it sooner if you're getting a much better value overall with all the exclusives and i guess the answer is yes some people do and that leaves a bad taste in their mouth for me i was really worried about this game the initial impressions of this game during the kickstarter campaign i think it only raised like two or three million dollars which given the fact that it was a marvel ip and a miniature game and simon was relatively low because it looked very simplistic in its gameplay and the miniatures were chibis which another turnoff for people especially some miniature guys i looked at it and i said first off that looks like the perfect base to be able to paint something for the first time with my kid he agreed after i already bought it but it also looked like it was the perfect element of the base game is this level of simplicity and then adding layer on layer on layer of complexity or strategy or tactical nature with some of the expansions and with some of the additional heroes and villains. I was very nervous when those cores showed up at retail. But the overall impression by non-Kickstarter backers who have picked it up at retail is very, very positive. I won't lie. There was some of that. I almost wish I bought two now because I think this one's going to go easily one and a half to two times the price at retail with all the exclusives with how good it could be. And I think it very much screams Marvel Legendary in a different form because of that aspect of adding elements of more complexity as you go. And not necessarily just keep on adding, 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 but also adding sideways too. So I did an all-in pledge. I have no qualms about saying that. Um, I think it's got almost all the heroes I could have asked for. They just announced, I think, last month that they're going to be doing an X-Men expansion Kickstarter. Because, let's be honest, my favorite expansion for Marvel Legendary is the X-Men. And not just the the nice, shiny, pretty X-Men, but some of the nitty-gritty ones. You know, the X-Force. Um, you know, Old Man Logan. You know, some of the, the you know, the, the wet ops sort of people. And it looks like you're getting all of the big name X-Men in this next one. So (laughs) if it turns out as good as I can see, this one is going to take the place of one or two games in my collection. Arcadia Quest may be getting a slot down now uh, if this turns out to be what I think it is, even though they're both sort of different. So we'll see. The expectation is high. But again, my expectation is tempered because... I'm not looking for it to be the absolute pinnacle, best game, most well-complete, well-balanced, rounded uh, sort of game. I'm looking for it to be chaotic, fun, that's different every time you play it, that isn't perfect, but wow, is it fun when you get it to the table, and let's joke about what happened this game versus the last game after you play. To be able to do so with my seven-year-old too, as well as paint it, that is just icing on the cake, folks. And that is why it is number one. So um, there you go. Um, I'm going to probably do a second video of this either in the next week or two after this comes out or even a little bit later into 2021 because there are probably a good half dozen of these games that I think are going to be delivering in the first half of 2021 that aren't going to be. And then I've got about another half dozen games 
that I know aren't going to be delivering in the first half of 2021 and will probably be quarter three, quarter four, or maybe even uh, 2022. Uh, I'm looking at you, Madara. Um, but I think that's worth following up too. I will also be having a video in the near future, much nearer future, talking about the games that are coming up on Kickstarter that you need to be aware of. And the problem right now, I'll tell you right now, spoilers for that video, is that there are not a lot of dates for the big campaigns or the big -er games that are known already for 2021. It's this month, or a lot of it is quarter one, quarter two. And so there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of timing, I think, that's still up in the air. And so it'll be interesting to see. But I'm going to talk about it probably in terms of quarters right now. Quarter one, these are the games you need to be aware of. Quarter two, these are the games you need to be aware of. So if that interests you, throw me a sub. I've got a Patreon, all that fun stuff. Anyway, you're sick of hearing that in all the other videos. So I'll leave that at it. So I'll leave that alone right now. Otherwise, uh, as always, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope my rambling is okay with you, especially if you make it this far in my video, which I don't really know how many people do. I wonder if I should start including things. Uh, again, my goal is a thousand subs in 2021 so if we start to creep up i'm going to start thinking about what i can do for giveaways if you are interested in a giveaway what would you like to see me give away um let me know what you think what's on your list what did i miss what did i screw up shoot me a comment thanks for watching stay classy see you next time